the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Seeker After Truth by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Milk of the Lioness There was once a time which was not a time when, in a far-off kingdom, all the people were waiting for the king's three daughters to be married. According to the laws of that realm, Princesses of the blood royal had the right to make absolutely anyone they wished their mates, and on this occasion the ladies found it difficult to make up their minds. Finally they asked their father to have the entire population of the kingdom paraded past them, so that they could make a choice. The first princess decided upon the tall and handsome son of one of the ministers, and the second chose the muscular and dashing son of the emir al Jaish, commander of the armies, as indeed everyone had always thought they would. But the third and youngest princess could not decide, and the endless stream of people only confused her more. So the princess took an apple and threw it into the air, saying, Whoever catches this shall be my husband. Now it so happened that in the crowd in the public square where this was taking place, there stood a young man with a limp and a hunched back, with his turban end thrown across his face, wearing ragged clothes and walking with the aid of a staff. This was the man who caught the apple, and who dragged himself to the platform where the royal family sat to claim his prize. The crowd cheered, more because of habit than anything else for inwardly they did not feel happy that such a man should become one of the ruling house. The son of the minister and the military commander's son muttered to themselves and to each other, and the king said to his minister, The royal word may never be withdrawn, so let the stupid girl have the clown or buffoon or whatever he is. At least I have two stalwart and reliable sons-in-law. What nobody knew at that time, of course, was that the youth was only pretending to be what he seemed to be. The lameness was affected, and the crouched posture was assumed, and he covered the lower part of his face because he did not want to be recognized. He was a fugitive Hashemite emir, concealing himself from persecution. All three girls were married, and, since the young prince Ibn Haydar did not reveal himself, he and his bride were banished to a stable to live by her enraged father. Even his own wife did not realize who Ibn Haydar was, but she loved him, whatever he looked like, and both of them accepted the life of poverty and ostracism which was their lot. Ibn Haydar used to walk, in the evenings, out of the city and contemplate in a small cave where nobody else ever seemed to go. After some months he met an old man, who said to him, Son of the lion, which is what Ibn Haydar means, you must wait until the day of lion milk. When you hear of this, you should take action towards the restitution. And the old man handed him a clear stone. Rub this stone in your right hand, and think of a very small broken coin and you can summon the magical charcoal mare. So saying, he went on his way. Now it came to pass that the king was engaged in war, and he rode out with his armies, his two valiant sons-in-law, and his commanders to engage the enemy. Naturally, they left the lame and misshapen Ibn Haydar behind. They fought many battles, but at last it seemed that the invaders of the country were gaining the upper hand. At this point, Ibn Haydar felt the stone grow hot in his pocket, and he took it out, remembering the broken coin. As he turned it in his fingers, a splendid charcoal-coloured mare appeared. It said to him, 
My lord, put on the accoutrements in my saddlebags. We ride to war. When he was fully arrayed in knightly mail, the youth leapt upon the back of the horse, and she flew through the skies until they reached the battlefield. The mysterious knight fought from dawn to dusk until the enemy were routed almost entirely through his bravery. The king rode up to him and threw his own cashmere shawl around his neck, saying, Blessings upon you, lordly one, for you have aided the good and opposed evil, and we are eternally in your debt. But Ibn Haydar said nothing. He bowed to the king, raised his lance in salutation, and spurring the magical mare into the clouds, returned home. When the warriors arrived back at the capital, they were full of tales of the mysterious knight who had saved them, and spoke of him as the Black Knight of Heaven. The king said again and again, Would that I had a son-in-law like that! Ibn Haydar, of course, continued to be the butt of jokes, a curiosity and a non-entity, even though he was the husband of a princess. After some months, the young man was sitting in his stable, when he felt the stone grow hot again. When he took it out and rubbed it, not forgetting to think of the coin, the horse appeared and said, On my back, we have work to do. The horse took him to the king's castle, through a window into the royal bedchamber, where Ibn Haydar was just in time to snatch and kill a snake which was about to strike at the head of the king. At that moment the monarch awoke and saw what had happened. In the gloom he could not see who his deliverer was, but he took off his priceless ruby ring and handed it to him, saying, I owe you my life, whoever you are. This ring shall be a token for you. Ibn Haydar took the ring and his steed flew him back to the miserable stable. His life continued as before for a number of months, when the stone called him again and he summoned the horse. Put on the robe and turban in my saddlebags, cried the mare, for we have work to do. The animal carried Ibn Haydar to the king's throne room, where a man had just been condemned to death. The executioner had already spread his leather carpet to catch the blood, and was awaiting the royal signal with sword upraised. At the sight of the black mare with the robed figure upon it, everyone stiffened as if made of wood. Ibn Haydar waited, and within a few moments there was a commotion at the throne room door. A man had arrived with proof that the condemned man was innocent. Everyone at the court was amazed, and the king said to the mysterious apparition, Blessings upon him who intervenes for justice. Take this sword of mine as a token. Without a word, Ibn Haydar girded on the sword, and the mayor took him back through the clouds, to his stable. Nothing of great importance happened for many more months, until one day the king became ill. It was as if the whole world had darkened, and people went about the streets as if in mourning. Even the animals were silent, the trees drooped, and the sun itself seemed dim. No doctor could find out what ailed the ruler, until the greatest of them all, the Hakim al hukuma the doctor of all doctors, pronounced, This illness is to be cured only by a draught of the milk of a lioness, brought from the land of not-being. Immediately the two sons-in-law of the king offered themselves for the task, and rode out from the palace in full determination to earn the glory of saving their lord and master. After many days they arrived at a crossroads, where a wise man sat. The road branched into three highways, and the two men were unable to decide which one to follow. They explained their mission to the wise man, who said, These three roads have names. The first is called The Road of Those Who Do As We Do, The Bond of Blood. The second is called The Road of Those Who Think As We Do, The Bond of Decision and the third is called the Road of Truth. The first son-in-law said, I shall take the Road of Blood, for it is through kinship with His Majesty that I am here. He spurred his horse on its way. The second son-in-law cried, 
I shall take the road of decision, for decisiveness is my way, and he galloped away. Presently the first young man came to a man at the entrance to a city, and asked him where he was. You are at the gateway to the land of not being, answered the man, but you cannot enter it until you have played chess with me. They sat and played, and the young man lost. He lost his horse, his armour, his money, and finally his freedom. The other man took him into the city and sold him to a cooked meat seller, and there he stayed for many days. As to the second youth, he, too, arrived at the gateway of the city, and the same thing happened to him. He was taken into the city and sold as a slave to a sweetmeat seller. After several months, when there was no sign of the return of the champions, Ibn Haydar felt the stone grow hot in his pocket, and he summoned the black mare. The time is now, she said. Jump on my back. He followed the same road until he reached the spot where the wise man sat and told him his mission. The man gave him his choice of the three roads, and Ibn Haydar said at once, I choose the road of truth. He was about to continue on his way when the wise man said, You have made the right choice. Continue, but when you get to the chess player, challenge him to combat rather than playing with him. Ibn Haydar went on, and when the chess player asked him to play, he drew his sword and cried, For truth, not tricks. Face reality, not token battle. See before you him who says, O people of Hashim, for that was his battle cry. The chess player surrendered without a fight, and told Ibn Haydar what had happened to his brothers-in-law. He took him into the city, and showed him where the lionesses were kept. After outwitting the guards and taming the beasts, the young man took three flasks of milk. He put one in each saddlebag, and one in his turban, as a precaution against their being broken or lost. Now he went to the sweetmeat seller and the vendor of cooked meats, and brought back the other two young men, although they did not recognize him in his knightly garb. That night, however, the pair of them, who knew that he had the lioness's milk, stole a flask each and fled the city under cover of darkness. Ibn Haydar gave them time to reach the palace, and then mounted the magical mare which, faster than an arrow, carried him to the very sick room of the ailing king. As he alighted from his horse and strode to the bed, the assembled doctors and courtiers and the brothers-in-law were awe-stricken at his appearance. As the turban he wore the cashmere shawl of the king, on his finger was the great ruby ring, and at his side hung the royal sword. Here is the milk of the lionesses of the land of not being, he said as he approached the bed. But you are too late, everyone cried. The king said, These sons-in-laws of mine have brought back the milk, but it does me no good. Ibn Haydar said, That is because they stole it from me, who obtained it, and all special virtue flees from something obtained by theft. Here is the third flask. Take a draught, O king. As soon as the king had swallowed a little of the milk, he sat up, completely cured. The king said, Whence do you come, and who are you, and why do you help me? The young man said, The three questions are one question, and an answer to the first is an answer to all. The answer to the second is an answer to all. The answer to the third is an answer to all. The king did not understand. Very well, said Ibn Haydar. I am the man who lives in the stable which means I am your son-in-law, which is why I help you. And that was how Ibn Haydar came to inherit the crown of the kingdom when the king was taken, in the fullness of time, on his longest journey. The Spirit of the Well There was once a couple who lived in a small village and who used to argue all the time. One day, 
the wife became so enraged with something said by her foul-mouthed husband that she clipped him around the ear and he tumbled into their deep well. Now at the bottom of that well, as is often the case, lived a genie, and he was an unusually fierce and abominable one. As soon as the husband saw him, he started to scream and shout, to pull him about and to shower upon him such abuse as he had not heard since the days of the great King Suleiman, son of David, upon whom peace, until the genie, affronted and affrighted, was forced to rise from his dwelling. This was how he came to ascend into the sky, towering over the terrified wife as she stood looking down into the depths of the well. Miserable woman, roared the genie as soon as he saw her. Who is responsible for flinging that unbelievably appalling human into my well, disturbing my peace and causing me to flee from my home of the past ten thousand years? What about me? asked the woman. I have had to live with that man for two decades, and you cannot stand him for two minutes. You unfortunate creature, cried the genie, for he was not without some better feelings, and the howls of the frightful husband were still ringing in his ears. I certainly do see your point of view. Well, said the woman, since I do not want him out of the well, and you do not want to go back, you might as well come along with me to the city, for I have decided to walk there to see what life might have in store for me. To stay here would be to starve, and in any case I want to get as far away from that man as possible. The genie agreed, and they set off along the road, chatting amicably together. Presently the genie said, How are you going to live in the big city? Something will turn up, said the woman. My suggestion, said the genie, is this. The king has a daughter. I will enter into her brain and possess her. Then you come along and cast me out, and the king will reward you. That is an excellent idea, said the woman. But there is one proviso, said the genie. That is, that you will only use the word of exorcism once, otherwise I will always be at your mercy. All right, said the woman. The genie sped on ahead and drove the princess completely mad. She writhed and she cried, she cursed and she threw herself about, and everyone soon realized that a genie of some kind had entered into her. As soon as the woman reached the town, she met people who told her the terrible story. The king, they added, has promised illimitable gold to anyone who can cure her and to hang anyone who falsely pretends to be able to do so. As soon as she reached the main market of the city, the woman began calling out, Genies cast out! The world's greatest caster out has arrived! Bring out your begenied people! I shall cast them out! Almost at once she was seized by the royal guards and taken to the king. The princess was brought forward, grimacing and howling, and the woman, using the word which the genie had told her, cast her out. Of course the king, as well as the princess, was delighted by this, and they rewarded the exorcist with as much gold as she wanted, and she established herself in a palace of her own, which rivaled that of the monarch himself. But the genie was not finished. After a few months roaming about, unable to go home to his well and feeling the need to do some further mischief, he found himself back in the selfsame city and, almost without noticing what he was doing, entered into the princess's mother, the queen. The king immediately called the exorcist woman and commanded, Cast out this demon at once, or I shall kill you. Since it was a matter of her life or the genie, she went to the queen's bedside and whispered the magic word. With a roar and a rush, the infuriated spirit stood beside her in the form of an ox with a snake's head, breathing out fumes and rolling his eyes. By the great King Suleiman, son of David, on whom peace, he roared, I shall seize you for this, and you will never be able to cast me out, 
for you will be too begenied to remember the magic word. My dear friend, said the clever woman, if you dare to do that, I shall immediately return to my husband, and you and I will have to enjoy him for the rest of your time inhabiting me. And, at the frightful prospect, the genie took flight, roared away, and has never been seen again. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.